my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you make good financial decisions in your life. You know, I can't possibly get to anywhere close to a tiny fraction of the questions posted for our show every day. And that's why since 1993, we've had our Team Clark Consumer Action Center. It's where you can get free one-on-one -on -one advice and guidance from our team of staff and volunteers. And you can learn more about when this is available, Monday to Friday, how to reach us at clark.com slash CAC. So a month ago, there was a big fuss involving Wendy's, which, you know, usually uh, the best thing is being talked about because what's the worst thing not being talked about? I don't think this was a case where Wendy's was glad to be so much in the news about menu pricing. And I want to give you my react to it and why Wendy's got really a bad rap in the marketplace of ideas. And coming up later, speaking of something that is so, so misunderstood, where AI, artificial intelligence, fits in your and my life right now, when you should trust it, and when you absolutely should not. So Wendy's was... And I think they're still going to put in all the controlled electronic pricing boards. And what Wendy's miscommunicated is that they were going to do dynamic demand pricing for their menus. Dynamic demand pricing is how so many things are priced now. I talked before about how when you're renting an apartment, how all the big apartment companies use dynamic demand pricing to rent apartments. And I want to share a crazy thing with you that I talked about four years ago. During COVID, my middle child, my daughter in California, was moving. And she was looking for an apartment. She was looking for a studio apartment. And the prices were crazy high. Because people were trying so hard to live by themselves because they were worried about COVID. And so we were looking at different apartment communities, complexes, whatever you call them. And I said to Steffi, I said, you know, we should see what one bedrooms and two bedrooms are. And we kept looking different places. And the funniest thing she ended up living for uh, two and a half years in an apartment where she got a two-bedroom for less than the cost of a studio because it was all dynamic demand pricing and nobody wanted two bedrooms. And so she was paying less for a two-bedroom than the person across the hall from her who was in a 520 square foot studio and she was in a 1080 square foot two bedroom. I mean, how weird is that? But, but the computer modeling of dynamic demand pricing is why when you go to look at an airline ticket, the price is never the price. Every flight, every day, every route, every airline, the prices are all over the place. Because the computer modeling is continually saying, okay, this seat is worth this at this time and worth half of that this other time. So Wendy's is like, hey, man, we're going to do this. When demand's low, we're going to offer lower prices. When demand's high, higher prices. All that was reported, and I think it's because we're all fed up with food inflation, is Wendy's was doing surge pricing. Surge pricing, like Uber and Lyft. I mean, it's nuts with Uber and Lyft if, if you 
um, are abused like I am riding both of them. And the prices are up and down and they're different one to another at the same moment, just crazy different for the same ride. So Wendy's totally botched the story and never got control of it. And if they had said, so we know what we charge at peak times, it's what's on our menu board. But we'd really like to get people in at other times when people aren't as likely to come in when, we, when we're empty. And so we are going to offer deals based on how many people are there. So these are our regular prices, but then we're going to offer deals. But the marketplace of ideas said Wendy's bad. Wendy's did a, you know, was going to do a terrible thing. But I've talked for years. I mean, Krista, how many times have you heard me over the years say that sit-down restaurants should offer off-peak prices mm -hmm. at slow times to get people in like, like restaurants in Florida used to do where they'd offer cheap prices if you'd come and eat at 4.30 to 6. Early bird specials. Yeah. And that was before computers. They had the early bird menu and they had the regular menu. Yeah. There's a restaurant we go to in Florida that still does it the old-fashioned way with, with two menus. And if you go there at 5.30 in the evening, every table is booked. Mm -hmm. And the early birds end at 6. And then at 6, the whole place empties out until <laughs> it gets busy again around 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I mean, the marketplace responds. And so... Um, I, and I think it's all how you do it. Uber and Lyft uh, have a trust problem with customers because they run up the prices to whatever. And there, there'll be these stories from time to time. This ride was $4,100 and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But if you use the clock as a way to offer people a deal that drives traffic when you wouldn't have it otherwise, why not? And then I'm going to say something people are going to hate. Sit-down restaurants, Friday and Saturday nights, they always, at a successful restaurant, they got far more demand than they have tables. Would it really be wrong if they charged more on Friday and Saturday night than they did Sunday through Thursday? Just asking. Just asking. All right. Well, Jeff in Nebraska is just asking this question. I avoid Venmo based on Clark's recommendation. I use Google Pay, which I just read is scheduled to be deleted in the U.S. and changed to Wallet, which does not have a peer-to-peer -peer cash payment system. What can I safely use on an Android phone? So, Jeff, it's fine to use Venmo or Cash App or PayPal if you set up a separate account, the easiest is to set up one of these no-fee online checking accounts with whoever, and just tie in that one thing to it and put Venmo, Cash App, or PayPal on your phone. And then the only money at risk is whatever you have in that online account. Never have your Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, uh, if you want to use Big Bad Zell, never have any of them at the same financial institution you do your other banking at because they all have what are called cross-default clauses in their agreements with you. So if somebody attacks the account you have just set up for Venmo, Cash App, PayPal, uh, Zelle, they have the right to go in and seize money from other accounts you have at the same institution usually. And if your account gets hacked with one of the payment apps. So that's why you do that at a completely cordoned off separate place. And then you'll be okay. And it's, it's a marketing problem at Google that Google will get people interested in something, get people signed up for it. And then one day Google says, you know, we don't want to do that anymore. And you just have to scramble and find something else. There's no sense of permanence with how Google offers services to the public. 
John in California says, I know you don't like debit cards, and I very, very rarely use my USAA one, but I'm considering getting a Charles Schwab debit card for an upcoming European tulip viewing trip ah. because of their professed benefits vis-a-vis -vis currency transactions. What would you recommend that I use for a credit or debit card in Europe? So uh, for a debit card, the Charles Schwab debit card is a superior choice. But I thought that the USAA debit card didn't charge foreign currency junk fees either. Before you go get the Schwab one, uh, make sure you're not okay with the USAA card you already have for pulling money out of an ATM. Um, the Schwab thing is awesome because you can do unlimited withdrawals from an ATM here overseas, no fee, they absorb whatever ATM junk fee there is, and they give you the banker's buying rate on getting money out. Just so you know, a lot of the big banks, when you uh, take money out with an ATM overseas, you may pay double very large junk fees that will just absolutely take your appetite away since we've been talking about food. <laughs> so uh, beware and be wary. The Schwab product is great. Otherwise, we have a list we just updated uh, just, uh, gosh, 10 days ago of the best no transaction fee credit cards to use when you're traveling outside the United States. This is something we update, is it twice a year we update this it's one? more often than that. More often pretty, than twice a yeah. year. Because it's such an area of high interest in our audience. So if you go on Clark.com, you can see the list of best credit cards with no foreign currency junk fees. And remember this, when you're overseas, when you're in, in the Netherlands or wherever you go, there's this ugly scam in Europe where when you uh, go to pay with your credit card, it'll pop up wanting you to pay in euro, I'm mean, sorry, in dollars instead of euros. Always say no, you always wanna clear your purchases in local currency, in euro, the banks are ripping people off about 10% in junk fees when you think they're doing you a favor offering to clear the transactions in dollars instead of local currency. You always clear in local currency. And I just want to say, like, you use the word scam, but, like, if someone asks you what, if you want to pay in dollars, or they're not trying to scam you. Like, that's just Well, they don't know. They're just the their, business. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not getting a cut of it. Right. It's the bank that's cheating you that they use for clearing. Yeah, I just want to clarify. Okay, Catherine in Georgia says, do we need RFID wallets to protect credit cards from getting hacked? Well, do we need them? Um, I use one. Do you use an RFID wallet? No. I do because just because it's one less thing to worry about because of the sniffers crooks have that they can potentially steal the transmittal. You know, almost all cards, credit and debit, have those three half circles mm -hmm. that signify that... Wireless it, payments. Mm -hmm. That it's wireless that you can just tap to pay. Tap to pay is actually a very safe way to pay until somebody steals that information from you. So uh, how important is it? We're not responsible for uh, stolen charges on a card of ours, as long as you notice within 60 days on a credit card. But it's a hassle. You know, you have to get the new number and all that stuff. So uh, is it essential to have RFID security people uh, generally say, yes, it's great to have an RFID wallet. Most wallets sold today are RFID because it's apparently not very expensive to make them where they protect the RFID signals. So it's one of the things I do because it's just one thing I don't want to have to deal with is getting suddenly fake charges on when well, they're not fake. Somebody made them with my card number. I'd rather not have to deal with that. Straight ahead, you know what I don't want to deal with? Fake AI. Information coming across AI that is totally wrong. We're going to talk about that straight ahead. So I like Google. 
But it seems lately like all I'm doing is saying bad things about Google. Um, Google is generating, when you do results, this AI response thing that's a joke. It's wrong so often. It's not even close. It's not horseshoes. You go and you search something on Google and you'll see this thing flashing and then it's kind of like a blue background. Then it pops up with what Google's AI thinks is the right answer. And it's so far off base over and over again, bonkers. And I just read a story in the Washington Post about how the big tax prep software people, not ready for prime time, rolled out AI for tax advice. And you trust it at your peril that repeatedly what the AI generated tax advice was, was wrong when you were uh, using tax prep software to prepare your tax return. I mean, this is the Wild West stage we're in completely with artificial intelligence. I think about how my son, who's 18, was all into chat GPT at first. It was I guess that was last year when that became a frenzy. And he said, look at this, and it can do this and do that and do the other. And then he uses it very seldom now because so much of what this, that, and the other were, were not ready for prime time. The answers were wrong. The information, the content generated was wrong. AI is going to have all kinds of uses we can't even get our arms around, both good and bad. But we're still way early pioneer. And there are uses that will be good assistance to people for various things. But there's also the thing you can't trust it. It cannot become a crutch. You're like, oh, I don't have to think about that. Boop. Oh, there's my answer. And then this crazy, crazy thing recently with um, AI being used to impersonate well-known people in the investment world and then give out financial advice that appears to be coming from a well-known and recognized individual and it's all uh, deep fake AI and people are getting scammed out of their money with these deep fake AI things. And it's an election year, we're gonna have a lot of stuff that AI has generated, fake stuff out there. And there are people who are gonna to wanna to believe badly of this person or that person, and they're just gonna buy it hook, line, and sinker. Know that AI is a very young infant. And it is, a potential tool is how I would put it. And sometimes is a useful tool. But we're not there yet and don't rely on it as fact. Double check anything you're buying into because before you know it, it could be fool's gold, the advice, information you see there. Do you use uh, AI responses? I don't. Have you looked at them? No. <laughs> I've been looking at them a lot to see. Sometimes it, it is really uh, cool. And then other mm -hmm. times it's like, oh, come on. Yeah. All right. We'll go to questions now. Casey in Hawaii says, during the spring of 2023, I accepted a new job in Honolulu, Hawaii. While my job paid for my moving expenses, it was evident quickly that the transition would be costly. The higher cost of living introduced significant financial requirements. Example, the cost to rent came with a $6,000 upfront expense with a security deposit and first month's rent. I had to make a tough decision to withdraw 10K to cover housing utilities and other expenses incurred during the transition from my Roth IRA with one of your children. The withdrawal was contributions, not earnings. I am not 59 and a half, did not buy a house, and wasn't needing the money for medical bills, only living expenses. For tax season, I received a 1099-R for the withdrawal. Am I going to be stuck paying taxes on my withdrawal even though I've already paid taxes on the money? No, this is a great question. And this year doing your taxes, 
you may want the help of an enrolled agent to help you with the taxes rather than using tax prep software. The reason is, is that what happens is that many times you'll be issued a 1099 of various types and you have to acknowledge it, report it, and then you back it out. So you have uh, essentially an exemption from having to pay tax on the, t the money you withdrew, the $10,000, because it was contributions, not earnings, that you took out. There are, there are some very arcane exceptions where that would not be true. It's so rare that I'm not going to get into that. So almost always, probably 99% of the time, this is a tax, a non-taxable event because it was contributions, not earnings. So having the help of an enrolled agent, which is a special category of someone uh, who is in registered with the IRS to do federal tax returns, is a really good idea so that you not mistakenly pay taxes on this Roth withdrawal, because there should be no tax on pulling out just contributions. I hope that the enormous additional expense of living in Hawaii is worth it because you're in Hawaii. <laughs> Do you know the number one place that Hawaiians are moving to right now because of the high cost of living in Hawaii? You mean outside of Hawaii? Outside of Hawaii. Where are they moving? I don't know. They're moving to the Las Vegas metro area. Oh, wow. There are so many people from Hawaii who've moved to the Las Vegas metro area that now there's all these Hawaiian-themed restaurants that have wow. opened up and uh, Hawaiian little um, grocery stores that people can get things that they miss from back home. Costco in Nevada is stocking items that are for people who move from Hawaii to the Las Vegas metro area. Wow. Okay. And there's no there's no ocean there. No, there? there's no ocean. No ocean there. Gladys in Georgia also wrote in. She said, I'm interested in obtaining an unsecured personal loan in the amount of $30,000 to assist my daughter to pay off medical school loans. She already graduated from medical school, but has to apply and do her residency. Unfortunately, she doesn't have the money to pay the school and has bad credit right now and no money. I have the credit, but not enough income because I get Social Security and a small amount from care jobs that I do on and off. Will I be eligible to obtain an unsecured personal loan and from where? Clark, please help me by directing me. Thank you. I appreciate all you do for us, the community out here. Gladys, that was very sweet. I appreciate your sentiments and it's very sweet of you as well when you don't have the, the funds or resources that you're trying to help your daughter out right now. And your daughter actually is the one who can help herself multiple ways. First of all, one of the, uh, to call them targets, one of the customer bases that banks are interested in more than most any other are people in your daughter's situation. Banks, small, generally local banks that love serving people that are going into residency who have completed medical school because they tend to be what's known as the double big dar barn door theory. They have a lot of expenses and a lot of income. They may have a lot of debt, a lot of income. And so they are ultra profitable for the banks fact that she has no money and her credit has not historically been good may not be the problem you think. But it's a big mistake for you to take on this 30000 because the money she owes to the school, the school may be able to help her in referral to a source that will help her. The school may, in fact, offer her a payment plan. She's going to start making money in residency, and after that, she'll make a lot more. In addition, she should ask other residents and other doctors what bank they use, and she'll find out the name of 
uh, two or three or four banks that are little banks she's never heard of that one of their areas of concentration is serving the medical market, serving the doctors. And they do take uh, risks, take chances with residents that normally in uh, credit underwriting, a financial institution would not take a chance on. So the answer really comes from her, not from you. Charles in Texas says, Clark, I just used GoodRx for the first time in years. It reduced the price of a prescription medication that was not covered by insurance from $650 to $44. Wait, I wait, wait, see... wait. Say those amounts again? Yep, $650 to $44. <laughs> I see not that... $644, $44. Right, right. Wow. I see that you have a great article on your website about GoodRx, but I just wanted to reiterate, reiterate to the Clarkies, always check GoodRx when filling a prescription, even if you have insurance. Yeah, and Charles, thank you for mentioning this because it bears repeating that I fill most of my prescriptions not using the pharmacy benefit I have available to me because the prescriptions are so much more expensive through the insurance plan I have than they are just being a cash payer. And this is something that you got to know is that many times employer provided prescription benefit plans are a ripoff. And being a cash payer of most of your medicines will be cheaper if you shop around. Use GoodRx, go to Costco, go to Sam's, go to Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Drugs, go somewhere other than traditional outlets and use traditional insurance coverage. You compare the price and you'll be stunned how much money you can save. I cut the cost of most of my prescriptions in half paying cash than using the insurance benefit I have for prescriptions, which is nuts, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I will add as an annex to that, Charles, though, we've had several people give feedback that they also take expensive meds, and there's a deductible they have to meet each year that what I do defeats getting the benefit when the insurance is useful if you don't run your lower cost medicines through the benefit plan, you end up paying anyway with more out of pocket on the expensive meds that you get through the plan. Just want to make that point. Today, I'm always into milestone days, aren't mm -hmm. I? Today is a big milestone. Eight years ago today, we started ClarkDeals.com because Truth be told, I wasn't thrilled with a lot of the deal sites that were in the marketplace because a lot of them were uh, basically advertorial sites where the deal sites pretended to be about deals, but really they were advertising sites where companies could get traffic for whatever they were trying to sell. And so we started Clark Deals eight years ago. And think about it, this was before the inflationary cycle. So uh, we started it just at the right time to be of more service to people. And so Clark deals, the only deals you'll ever see are deals that we believe in our head and our heart are good deals for your wallet. Yeah. And we have a great team. Uh, Karis has been since the beginning. Sarah, Theo, uh, Jen, Danny, Alyssa, Anthony does videos. Anthony, who works on our volunteers and consumer action center, works on Clark.com and ClarkDeals.com. But congratulations to everyone. They he work never so sleeps. hard. No. Yeah. I don't think Karis. Karis doesn't sleep, sleep either, either. Or Sarah. Yeah. They yeah. all work really, really hard. Yeah. They're amazing and people. They are dedicated to helping you stretch every dollar that goes in that wallet of yours. We want it to stay in your wallet as much as possible. And so I'm really, really proud of our deals team. And I hope that you have found an opportunity to save good money on things you need and things you want, because there's both needs and wants in life, life, that you're able to get better deals because of what we make available at ClarkDeals.com. We also have a daily newsletter mm -hmm. hitting you with the best deals that we have found, again, 
no games, no gimmicks, and nobody's paying us to say what we say. So we're devoted to helping you save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off, and have a great day.